Hello everybody. Recently here at the dojo we were talking about different ways to train and we came to a uh, conclusion that I found kind of startling which is that the aspiration toward chess culture could itself be seen as a training method. And so with this video I'm going to try to flesh out what might be meant by that. Now, I do want to begin by saying that I did not grow up with chess culture, uh, being in America. There's always some kind of culture, but there isn't this deeper sense of chess culture that you experience when you, I think, especially go to Eastern Europe. And just as an anecdote to try to begin to flesh this out, uh, when I was playing a tournament in Hungary around 2003, you know, you imagine a big open hall with a lot of chess boards and after the round everyone is expected to set the pieces up. Well somebody didn't set the pieces up and the arbiter came around and every time he saw a set that wasn't set up he would say ninja cultura i.e. no chess culture. So um, the idea of chess culture being part of chess etiquette I think makes sense to everyone. But how does that sense of etiquette move on toward playing skill and the way you play the game? That's what I want to talk about mostly today. Okay, so let's begin with, uh, we have this position, and this was a position where me and I am Kostikovutsky were doing commentary on uh, between Vishnu and the world's largest eyelash. And this is just a fun game being played on our Sunday Night Fights show. And um, here we're waiting for... Black has just played Knight H5, and we're waiting for Vishnu to move here. And I told uh, Kostya, I said, I think he might play G3. And Kostya reacted in horror, and um, we were both offended by this move, g3, which in fact was played. And, you know, Kosi is a very uh, gentle soul, that, so for him to kind of be willing to make fun of Vishnu is kind of interesting for me. Um, I make fun of people maybe more readily. And the thing about it, though, that's very instructive is to say something like, uh, there are certain kinds of moves that you don't make, and you will be shamed if you make those moves. It's kind of a weird concept, right? Because shame is an unpopular idea at the moment especially, but it pertains to norms. And um, if we go back to this list of training methods, when I think about where I'm mostly situated, and by the way, all of these training methods don't need to be exclusive, right? But when I think about myself, I really believe in studying my own games. And one of the things that happens when you study your own games is you develop a kind of super ego in the back of your mind, which is going to judge you for doing certain things. And certain things are, certain red lights and stop signs are going to be developed in your thinking just so that you, you avoid doing certain things or think about things in certain ways. And that's where chess culture is really interesting because it is a way of thinking about chess where you are part of a community Maybe and, and maybe not just a world community, but maybe you're part of the Armenian chess school. Maybe you're part of a specific school in a specific place. And that has a really interesting advantages because it gives you a framework for how to think about the game. Okay, so I want to share a position uh, that I had where um, I was in... This was also in Hungary back in around 2003. And um, I was playing this beautiful tournament uh, in Budapest. And afterward, we would go, um, some of us would go to this great barn called Sixtus. And my friend Gabor was there as a chess bar. And you'd go there and you'd have maybe a drink or two after the round and talk uh, and maybe show your game. 
And so I have a friend there. His name was Gabor, and he was lower rated than me. And so, you know, in the hierarchy of things, generally they don't, these are the players that don't shout at you. But he shouted at me for getting a terrible night in this game. And what I particularly remember was that he said, looking at me very forcefully several times, Jesse, I never want to see you have a night like this again. And he was like holding it up in his hands. You know, I never want to see you have a night like this again. And it really stuck with me. And it was like a scolding, a shaming. Um, and this was actually before I had understood that I had to had to go over my own games. So it was a way for me to improve without doing the really hard work. But the first thing I want to say, there's two funny uh, misrememberings I have, misrecollections about this game. And the first is my knight never got onto A1, but the scolding was so bad that in my mind the knight was on A1. The second thing about it that I misremembered that's just funny is that my opponent was Ovsejevich, and um, I remembered the name as Svyagintsev. And Svyagintsev is another GM, quite good, but also with some V's and some J's, and V's in the same kind of similar spots. So at some point, my memory had decided that my opponent in this game was in fact Svyagintsev. And I imagine somewhere in China or India, there's somebody who played Jakob Agard and then thinks that it was me with our names being similar. Okay, so here's the moment where I didn't make a mistake, but there's a choice that I'm going to make that uh, I'm going to have to have a deeper awareness of. And this is where I think chess culture, what I got out of it, really taught me a lot. So let's pretend that there's only two choices for white, and that is to play knight b5 or knight c2. Now, um, it's a question of where is the knight going to go. Both are very playable, and maybe I should begin by saying that black's last move, knight d7, was very provocative. Provocative because he's going to invest so much time in uh, making an amazing knight on c5. And let's just say in a couple other obvious things, white has better development but less space. And... Uh, that's going to be the dynamic that black is really going to try to push with this knight d7 c5 thing. And whenever you have less space, as I did in this game, I want to be very sensitive to not getting one of my minor pieces dominated. And I was not. I was not sensitive to that. And it's this lack of sensitivity that's going to get me to Gabor screaming at me. Don't ever let me see you have a knight like this again. So provocative move, and think about provocative, sometimes we say provocative as in thought-provoking, but this is really provocative in the sense that I'm being provoked into anger or, you know, doing something uh, maybe out of control. And um, I played knight b5, and this is in fact totally fine, I think, but I have to be very sensitive to that knight becoming poor. And it's not hard to imagine that if this pawn ever got to kick me, well, then I really have to go home. I really have to go home, and it will also blunt this bishop if he gets the pawn to c6. Okay, so knight c2, very easy way to play. B th knight c5, b3, bishop a3, hack the knight, play against d4, white has an easy advantage. Now, again, that's not to say that knight b5 is wrong. It's just that knight b5 entails a risk that my knight will get dominated, and that risk is something I didn't appreciate enough. So, rook e1, and I believe my intention was reasonable in the sense that on bishop f5, I believe I intended to do something like this, and I think I have good play. Instead, my opponent played bishop g4, and i pretty sure, even though this was so long ago, this was 2003, that I didn't... Um, expect this move. And here's the moment where I go awry. Um, 
what I should surely play is bishop f4 and kind of wait to see what he does. But a key idea could be something like this. Rook c8, h3. And if he takes, when I take back, I'm actually going to threaten to take a knight a7. And the key thing to see in a, uh, in a variation like that is I really need that knight to do something. It really has to do something. And um, if it were to go back, then I think I want to do something like that. Uh, and again, on, on a bishop d3 move, I think I'm going to play something like snip and knight a7. This is all, by the way, I did this all without the computer because I didn't want it to uh, lead me astray in terms of how I saw the position with human eyes. So this is just my human sense of how I should have played this position. So bishop g5 is what I, in fact, did, not appreciating that if I get my knight dominated, everything else is going to be poisoned in my position. So let's look at what happened. Knight e6, snip, snip, queen d2. And it, on a certain level, it seems like I'm doing great. But watch what black does. He says, all right, I'm just going to get rid of your knight and c6. And now... Whatever problems I might otherwise have in this to, in this position, for example, a lack of development, uh, you white will your position is poisoned because your knight is so terrible and has to go to a three. And one of the things I remember very vividly about that knight at six twos was that I was unwilling to recognize that Kapoor was right. I was like, I have the unopposed, you know, it's not only the unopposed bishop, I have the only bishop, my rook is on the e-file, I'm better developed, yada, yada. But I didn't appreciate how bad this knight was. So I'll just show the rest of the game. And um, I thought black played it well. And there's probably other things black could have done. Um... And in the end, I feel like I was lucky to draw. During the game, I felt like I should somehow still be better. Um, and in this position, I offered a draw. And that's another thing I want to talk about in another video, is the evolution of draw culture. My sense is that black is doing better here with a move like rook f7. So I was lucky, really, to get the draw, and I was then worse from a position where I was much better. So to just try to put it in words, the idea of chess culture uh, can combine with a lot of these other methods that we are talking about, but it's something that for Americans I think is especially hard um, because there's very little social pressure uh, for those of us who, who are playing the game, and usually we're studying the game alone. And chess culture really happens when you have a coach and maybe a cohort, a group of people around you who are establishing norms about how you approach specific positions, how you think about stuff. And that's very related, I think, to the question of chess etiquette which, as you can see, with Capablanca, this very beautifully dressed man, you know, chess etiquette, of course, has evolved as well. It's hard for me to even imagine sitting at a board in a suit that seems like it must be both hard to put on and uncomfortable. But that's the thing about norms. They force us to be uncomfortable or push past our limits in a lot of ways, and that's uh, an advantage of chess culture. One anecdote that I want to tell to just finish this story off where it shows how chess culture can bleed into other aspects of the game is I remember Jan Elvis, who used to be number three in the world, talking about one of the U.S.'s top women players. And he dismissed her in this interesting way where he said, well, she doesn't even study her own games. And so that, of course, is number, my method of choice of improvement. And the interesting thing about that anecdote for me was to say, it's not just that she's not going to improve because she's not going for her own games, but that she has no chess culture 
because she doesn't go over her own games. And so chess culture, of course, can uh, have the expectation that you do other things on this list. And um, that's where I think chess culture, too, is interesting in terms of how it's evolving because now with social media, you are not, if you choose to be, you are not alone. You have this whole cohort of people out there with whom you can share your games and your thoughts and everything else. So it's an evolving situation. And I think you can say, even though the chess dojo hasn't been around that long, that there's a certain cohort there who uh, on Twitter and on the Discord are talking to each other and establishing, you know, how should things be done? What is the right way? And so that is what I think chess culture is about, but I could be wrong and I'm willing to learn from it. It's certainly something that I didn't grow up with and uh, in a way I'm envious of, especially the Eastern Europeans. Okay, bye-bye.